Third thing, railroads. We have canals and roads, railroads were the most important, by far. That's the rocket, the first steam engine, workable steam engine in Great Britain. Steam locomotive, I'm sorry, steam locomotive. And it was the first one that didn't blow up immediately. And if you go there, it's very small. You got the tank with the water and where the piston was, and you stand next to it. I, I was a little bit taller, and they have one in York. They have a big train museum in York, England. Not like trains, so I had to go to it. And it can whiz along. You might want to grab your desk when I tell you this. It's going to blow your mind between 10 and 12 miles an hour. Yeah. Whoa! Just, yeah, the rocket. Now, of course, that doesn't seem very fast. And board, you can ride on a horse for long, or for faster than that. Or, heck, I can run four or five times faster than that. <laughs> Especially if you're dropping out of a car going about 60. I can run, I can maintain that speed for seconds. <laughs> Okay, so, but the thing is, it's not an animal doing it. That's what made it so remarkable as a machine. Now, the first one in the United States was Peter Cooper's Tom Thumb. Tom Thumb was a Tom Thumb was a circus act. He was a very short man, was three foot tall. So they called it that because it was a relatively small engine. And it got to the United States. The design was kind of copied. American engines are different than European engines, but the big thing is now this, incredibly expensive to make, but could dramatically lower transportation costs and bring people together like nothing ever has in history. And so passenger cars, and I love this picture. Look at the cars. What do they look like? And, and I like this part, you know, they're just like, wow! Bugs are going in their teeth, the soot is catching their hair on fire, and it's all the fun of riding. And they're using wood power. Wood wood burns fairly well, but not as hot as coal, especially coal that's been superheated, called coke, burns hotter. And eventually that would be used for the steam engine. But to give you an idea how things change, just an idea how fast railroads change everything. There's nothing in any of our lifetime that compared to this change. I'm waiting for it. 1830, only 13 miles of track, just a little stretch of track from Baltimore to the B&O Railroad. By 1850, 9,000, 1850, 9,000, 1860, look at that number, over 31,000 miles of track. And the cost, every time you build tracks, and because of competition between different railroads, I mentioned only three cents a time mile, now that's not as, as cheap as, as canals, but railroads give you the flexibility. Railroads go significantly faster and they can haul heavy goods. Yeah. What was the one railroad that went all the way to the west? Well, it's not coming yet, but that's Transcontinental Railroad, and that's like the Union Pacific. Well, there's a bunch of railroads that did that. There's a lot of famous ones. But the first Transcontinental Railroad, that would be the first one to connect the Pacific. To the rest of the United States. That was the Union Pacific in the Central. And that's coming 1869. Big, big deal. Because think about it's not just all these miles of track. What does it require to build a railroad? Because this is the thing railroad, just the railroad itself is industrial. Just to build a railroad is huge industry. What do you need to make a railroad? What do you need? Huh? You need a lot of wood. Lots of wood. What are the rails made out of? Jello. What else? Well, okay, iron was first, but iron, well, iron's relatively soft, and so iron will eventually spread, and that's the biggest cause of derailments to this day. And so steel. Iron and then steel. What else do you need? A lot of workers. Okay, you could have relatively unskilled workers who do some job, but now you need skilled workers. You need very skilled workers that have to have training, schooling. You need engineers. You need people who understand how to work and repair an engine. So you need better schools. Railroads, it's no coincidence that you have the expansion of public schools and the expansion of universities every place where railroads work. Because you need trained workers. You can't have any Yahoo doing this. 
Hey, let's just build that track up that hill. It'll be fun. No, you got to know what you're doing. What else do you need? What else do you need? We got wood, we got iron, we got steel. What else? Huh? Lots of black powder. And this one of the big reasons why they would make high explosives and then come after the silver. That's coming after TNT, dynamite. You need lots of leather for seats, right? You need oil for lubricants, because it seems the wheels jab. What else do you need? Train. Train. What do you need? What is the thing that switches on? So you need not only you need either either more rails or or uh, uh, oh my goodness now. You said the switching thing and now I can't think of the word. Yeah, but there's a name for it where you turn the tracks so and they go to a siding. Yeah. But it's gone now. Thank you for saying switching thing. <laughs> now, like, oh, now the only thing I have in mind is switching thing. You know, as soon as everyone leaves for lunch, we're gonna I'll remember. remember. We'll all remember. Now watch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but not only that, train coming, train coming. What well, might be nice right over? Brakes. Brakes. <laughs> you can't just put your feet down. Dexter, I'm not listening. Sorry. I'm not even miss that. But first you need disc brakes, but eventually <laughs> studying the vacuum would lead to hydraulic brakes. You know, all of this stuff. The thing is, all these new technologies creates new technologies. They build on the shoulders of others. And once you have some of these technologies, that encourages others. It's not that people weren't smart before and didn't invent, let's say, well, same deal. Train coming. We have to not make better bridges, of course. But bridge out, train coming, bridge out, train coming. What do we do? Hope for the best? I guess. Speed up. <laughs> Speed up and hope you jump and get a ramp. How long did it take to Huh? A really long time. Yeah. Oh, trains take forever to stop. Yeah, brakes, brakes, they, they, they still take. A train going about 60 miles an hour would take about two miles to stop. Don't they make like buggers? Don't they that stops? It doesn't stop them, but it means it's like eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> trains are so dangerous. No, it's not. But they're also incredibly efficient. Communication. Telegram. You need a telegraph line. Telegraph came from railroads. Coal, iron mining. What time is noon? When is noon? So everybody has their own time, don't they? Everybody has their own noon, right? Right. Why do they have time zones? So railroads could do time schedule. They just made time zones. Railroads just did it, and we all just accepted it. You could go on and on, but railroads on their own is major industry. Railroads produce railroads bought out much of the goods of the Industrial Revolution, which ironically they would encourage more railroads, which would buy more. This map though is even more startling. Just like remember the canal map. Now look at this one. <coughs> 1850 to 9,000 miles of track. Look how limited it is, right? Look at 1860. And where is most of the track? This would be huge. One of the major reasons why the United States won the Civil War. When the U.S. won the Civil War, it was partially because of the industrial mind. It almost happened in 1850. I mean, almost happened. This world, 1850, almost certainly the South would have won. Almost certainly. One of many reasons, but one of the most important was the industrialization, especially in railroads that the North had, to get goods and equipment around, and the United States won. It really was that close. It's one of those amazing things because, yeah, 1850, it was literally inches away from the Civil War. I don't know how they measured that. Here it happened. This also shows the amount of track mileage built. Once it started going, now there was they built too, they built more than they needed, but still it's remarkable. But look at this. By 1859, look how fast it is to move goods now. So here's New York City. Now all this in one day. Chicago, less than two days to ship goods. Now trains have to stop every 15 miles. So you have to build a whole infrastructure for trade. Why, why did they have to stop? Why did, why did they have to stop every 15 miles? Water. Yeah, why, they need water every 15, coal every 30. For the steam. 
So that you know, they can, in fact, by this time, they could go fast, well over 50 miles per hour. By the end of the century, they had locomotives that could, that could go well over 100. They might have not spent stuff like the city. But they still have to stop all the time. They could go a little bit further. They had, they had bigger water tanks. They go a little bit further. You ever look and wonder why there, there's places like Reed Point or Roundup, Terry, you know these little towns? Yeah, they're on the railroad. Now, this would seem, I'll tell you one more thing really quick since we're on railroads. When they started building tracks across Montana, and one of the transcontinentals that didn't make it, it was called the Milwaukee. Have you driven to Missoula? And say you're driving to Missoula on the interstate, and there's a couple of them on your left going to Missoula. There's these big brick buildings that are just kind of there. You ever see those? They were the first one to do electric rails, and those are little electrical power plants. Yeah, they were elect they tried electric rail, but it, it didn't work for them. Milwaukee was really poorly gone, they went out of business. So that's why there's a there's like a tunnel that just there. Pretty fast. Yes, uh, the technology, te the technological changes that happened in my lifetime, not really here, it already happened, but in my lifetime, did decrease, you know, you know, brought people closer together, but nothing compared to this. Nothing. Just all of a sudden now, you could go places you never could go before. News, information, and products that you could only dream about getting, now it could happen because of trend. Not only that, inbreeding went down dramatically. Right? You could go meet other people that aren't your cousins. It was a huge problem. Less people who look like horses. I think that's positive. So, the overall result of this shipping prices have, this would be a major boost to the Industrial Revolution. If shipping prices went down by approximately 50% in the first 50 years of the Industrial Revolution, what that meant is goods to market, people had access to goods, and once people started getting these goods, they wanted them, it increased demand. And here's the other thing, <coughs> almost all of this, direct or indirect, massive government aid to business. Massive. Now this was mostly states at this time, after the Civil War, more and more the federal government, now the federal government gives billions of dollars, that means taxpayer money, for transportation, which is a direct boost to business. You can't have, you can't have capitalism without modern transportation. Period. Because you can't get goods to market. And that is massive government aid. So government has always helped business in lots of ways. All right, so that is it, and I like, this is the one, Right here, you see upstream river rays, and all of a sudden drop like a rock. Steam. That's when steam came in. All of a sudden, we go up river, yay! And look at um, canals. Whew. That's why it sounded bad. Whew. All right, number four. The fourth big factor is interchangeable parts. Now, interchangeable parts, now this, I did not add this, so add this part. Interchangeable parts made by machines. Made by machines. That is the key element. And this will soon be dubbed the American system. The American system of industry, the American system. Parts made by machines, not by skilled craftsmen, made by machines. I'll tell you how I got the American system name in just a second, but how it got started in the US, the, the roots of this was that man right there, Eli Whitney. Now, Eli Whitney is also known. He is a great tinkerer, a, a great entrepreneur who invented or stole ideas. He's also known for the cotton gin. But Eli Whitney brought the concept of interchangeable parts to the United States, one of the first ones in muskets. And muskets were one of the big industrial parts because governments need muskets for their military. These are arms. Firearms are weapons. And Whitney convinced Thomas Jefferson that he had a way, the machines that would make the individual parts for muskets. Now Jefferson was just blown away by this. Before muskets were made individually by hand, every single musket, in fact everything was unique. For the most part, if a part broke, you had to remake it, make a whole new part by hand. But now, with these technically, the idea is, 
you can pump park brakes, you put in a new part. And not only that, if a skilled craft or a worker or a machine just works on building one part, like the trigger mechanism, they become really good and therefore efficient at making that one part, don't they? So it's efficiency. It's going to be called divisional labor. We'll get to that in just one second. But making muskets. Jefferson, who feared factories but liked machines, he was, he was an inventor. He, you know, he knew his audience. He went into the executive mansion, this is 1803, with a barrel full of 10, of parts of 10 muskets, all broken up. He took the barrel and dumped it on Jefferson's desk. And Jefferson was like a little kid. He was like, oh, this is great. And he was just so impressed. He'd never seen anything like it. It blew their mind away. You know, today we just, oh yeah, interchangeable parts. It makes sense, right? I mean, it just kind of makes sense to us. Then their mind didn't work that way because it just was impossible. Jefferson got up, put these muskets together, took them apart, put them together again. Whitney got the contract. And this would be his factory in Springfield, Massachusetts. They still make Massachusetts, they still make weapons there today. Now Whitney lied to his team. He didn't have these machines. He had them built by hand, carefully designed so they're all the same, and then lied to jobs. But it worked. And that's how it came. The machines that do this work are called a big face of Eli Whitney. <laughs> machine tools. Machine tools are the machines that actually make this problems. So this is a drill. You know, it's boring. It's, all these bells are powered by originally by water, then eventually steam. It's boring a hole into a musket barrel. See the barrel right there? It's a little hole. That's a drill. That is a lathe that's cutting the wood for the stock. And once you start these and figure out how to work and how to power, make it go quickly spread to other machines. Now we're not to an assembly line yet, but now we have interchangeable parts. In 1851, there was a big exposition in Great Britain where Britain was going to show off all their great inventions of the Industrial Revolution. And Britain was leading it at that time still. But what wowed everybody were American interchangeable parts. And that's why Europeans call it the American system, and that's why we have the name today. Now here's the thing. Once you have machines do this, and the workers are no longer skilled craftsmen doing this, but people operating the machines doing the work, <clears throat> this is a radical change that changes the world. What's going to be created? Now you have machines, you need a building, thus the factory system, where you have all production under one roof. <coughs> And so that is the roof, and this is textiles. Look how complex all these belts are being spinning and whirling. That had to be so incredibly dangerous. But it's expensive to make it safer, so it's dangerous. And the thing is, this is where you get the modern term capital. Capital, that's the means of production. The most important piece of capital is, of course, the machines. But it's also the building, the fuel, the land it's on, the transportation. That's capital. And therefore, it's owned by one person or entity. What do we call that person who owns the capital? What? Did you say it, Dexter? <laughs> what do they call it? The person who owns the capital is the what? You heard the term capitalist. All capitalist means is they own the capital. Now, a lot of times people say capital, they say it's money. Capital is only money if it's a bank. But you need money to buy capital. So we get a shorthand that is actually a profit. I think probably shouldn't be used, but people say it all the time. What's the only thing in this picture, these two pictures, that's not capital? Someone said what? Yeah. He's not capital. He's a labor. We're coming up with a new economic system where you have the people who own the factories dominate the economy. Now, it costs a lot to build a factory. That, I mean, these aren't cheap, right? Why would they have capitalists do this? What do they get in return? Say it again, what? Because they're right. It's money. What? They get all the profit. The capitalist gets all 
100% of the profit. Every penny. Every, the capitalist owns the factory. So all the profit they make from selling their goods, they get it all. All of them. What's their motivation to work for them? What's the motivation for labor? For food? They gotta survive. <laughs> if you have no other way to survive, what do you gotta do? You work. And you gotta take whatever job you can get. And by the way, look at how complex this is. Would you want a guy just a bunch of people working there and do whatever they want? It's got to be really pretty strictly controlled. And so what we have come to this then is the beginnings of the factory system and number five, the first textiles. And textiles using the power loom, incredibly dangerous but efficient, could do the work of a hundred people. Instead of uh, by hand looming it, the power loom can make textiles, cotton textiles, so fast it's incredible. As long as you have power. And if you look at this, these are spindles, and they have thread right there, and all the thread would be whirling off that and be used to make the cloth, which is being has to be draped over these things right here. And it's really dangerous, super dangerous. But a couple things about this. First off. This man right here, Samuel Slater. Samuel Slater was a supervisor. He worked at a plant in England. Actually, stop. He memorized the entire factory. He memorized the loom, the power structure, and brought and to went to Massachusetts with that memory in his head. Britain made laws that said you could not bring their technology out of the country, punishable by jail, because they want to keep the monopoly. That's what he memorizes. We had to be a pretty incredible guy, but remember something. Remember something. How long I'm saying this? People back then had significantly better memories than people today. Significantly better. Like maybe a thousand percent. They knew more than people today. Because they had to. And think about it, before before the printing press, they had to know even more. So they must have been just shocking. Of course, their entire most of their life, what they knew was just involved with survival. But but still, they, have, they know more than people today. So in a lot of ways, they're a lot smarter. A lot of ways. What I'm saying is the older generation, like my generation. Actually, there is an element of truth to that. People, when, my, when I was in high school, we had to know more than you do today. Just more basic stuff. Yeah. I'm not saying that you're not smart. No, you're smart. It's just that we had to know more stuff because we didn't have the same kind of tools. Yeah, you don't have to follow them. Hmm? You don't have to follow them. Or, or for that matter, even though there were calculators, uh, we had an abacus. <laughs> Actually, I learned how to use a slide rule. But we had to do we had to do significantly more by hand. Well, why New England? Water power. Here is a water powered mill. It's hard to see it, but there's a mill right back here and a wheel that turned. And you basically try to figure out some way to get fast moving streams to turn a wheel. New England, Bull Mountains, fast moving streams. That's why there's no factories, originally textiles in the south. You think the South would be perfect because that's where more cotton is. But because it's so flat, slow moving, moving streams, didn't turn the wheels very well. That's why the first textile mills in Britain were in Scotland. You ever been to Scotland, low mountains, fast moving streams, or in Wales. So, what we come out of this though, in once you have the factory system, if there would be a name for it, would start in New England out of this place right here. Over 3,000 employees in Lowell. And this is pretty remarkable. How many people work in the factories? This is by 1845. That's pretty remarkable. Fast it happened. They all worked in big round purple circles. It's called the Lowell system. And what the Lowell system was was a very regimented factory system. Because owners of factories did not want people with free will. Owners of factories want people to follow orders and obey, to show up on work on time not leave any time they want to go to the bathroom, not leave when they want to go to lunch. They want people to follow orders and obey and do things exactly right. Now, partially it makes sense. They own the capital. And also, it could be very dangerous if people are freelancing. But also, you know, if everyone's under their control, they become more efficient, and therefore they make more profit, and they get wealthier. Yes? So, what would happen if someone got injured on the There's just no one cares. Fire. Of course. 
workers had to fight very, very, very what owners fought fought as hard as they could. The capitalists, you know, those are the capital to keep things that like workers' compensation laws out. Workers had to fight really hard for that, and they still fight against it to this day. They want to get rid of it, so they just you got hurt. It's your fault. Boom. It's happening in some states. Those, those laws are kind of going away. Have you been to Alabama? Wisconsin too. We got we're kind of we're backtracking to that all over the U.S. Well, who they got? Girls. And they call them the Lowell Mill Girls. And there's a great sign doing it. And the reason why is men, and this might shock you, but men at this time really thought they had something weird called liberty. They didn't feel like, they didn't want to work in a place where they were ordered what to do and they had no real rights, where they were dependent upon somebody else for a wage. They didn't like that. But girls were perfect. Think about young girls. They're taught from day one to be what? What? Obedient to whom? To men. Follow orders. Do what they say. Subservient. Women are taught that. Women were the first factory workers in this Lowell system. And what it does is by opening this up to women, you have women coming in who by, not only by the fact that they're subservient, I start walking backwards and think, God, I'm on a trip. Us. But you increase the number of workers, they're relatively on scale. What happens to wages? So, men who have no other option eventually have no choice but to take these jobs and accept it, or they sell it. But women will be first, and they try to regiment every part of their life to make them more efficient. So, they had restrictions against dating, they had restrictions, uh, you know, well, if a woman got pregnant, they're gone. That'd be the norm until the 1980s. Still happens all the time, but it was just the norm in the 1980s. You can see it right now. You know, people say, "How can how can some a woman run a company do this?" Because they're not children. You say that all the time. See it in politics too. But that was one thing. They wanted to control their life. Uh, other factory owners would do this. It's became very common. Today they still do it. I mean, heck, they. Companies today read people's emails, they check their Facebook pages, they still control their lives all the time. And technically that's illegal, but people can't really do a lot. And this is a table every time when you're supposed to be to eat, to eat lunch, get up, go to bed, it's all regimented for them. Every moment of the day. Now this is an exaggeration how it happened, but this would become the norm in the factory system. That's how they want workers to be. It's today. You can hear them screaming down the hall. And this would also be the beginnings of unions. Some of the first workers who would organize because alone they don't have power. Together, workers have power. Would be young women in these factories. And this is a one of the factories. This is actually a striker. This actually comes from 18, I think 48, but it's written, they were still singing in 1898, where women working here. Part of the reason was because of the treatment, because of the low wages, but we mentioned danger. You can see it kind of here with these, this is thread that's being run from spindles down here and would spin from here and come up through for the uh, clock. And if, if it jammed or they had to replace one of the spindles of thread, they were going to stop the whole machine. What do you got to do? Reach your hand in and remove it. Think about thread whirling around at really high speed. Thread. Catches your finger, what happens? It was so dangerous. Oh, yeah, a lot of them had fingers. Or catch their arm, yank the arm off. That happened a lot. Now, they could have made it safer, but that's a cost. And so that eats into profits. And so that would be the beginning of unions. We'll come back to unions. All right, next. Where's my mouse? This shows in how a lot of mills started here. A few down here, but the big ones were here. But still, most of the cotton was still, it's still brick. All right, next, steam power. Once you have this, steam power would be another source of fuel. And the big areas was the Middle Atlantic, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. Iron and coal was very plentiful there. 
So these are iron miners, mules down in the, used to pull them. Miserable, awful, shockingly dangerous work. Nobody likes to think about how awful the producers are of these products are. If people looked about what happened with their clothing, you think about it for a second. It's pretty shocking you realize that, yeah, we get cheap clothes and how bad people work. These are coal, these are breaker boys. And they would sit on these chutes and do this for 14 hours a day, breaking up the coal in small pieces. And hopefully they don't fall in. Because they fall, they're killed. But that's an iron work. We'll talk more about child labor, but the point is it's not coal and iron. And so the first really big steam in iron industry, steel industry, is going to be in Pennsylvania and New York. Pittsburgh is going to be the steel city because of this, for example, because it's right there. Hmm? Yeah, in fact, their symbol is the, uh, this, the, their logo is the logo of U.S. Steel. James Watt, though, from Britain, would come up with the first workable steam engine that was efficient enough to use. There are other steam engines, but James Watt did this. And it's a remarkable device. It would be steam that would bring the Industrial Revolution. Steam, and those who had the steam power that would dominate the world by the end of the 19th century, including the United States, with a great competitive advantage to everybody else that you still see to this day. And the big thing was this, here's water, you boil water, steam goes in here. This is a piston. The cam right here is pushed up by the steam, and then they release the steam that comes down. Steam comes in, comes down. That turns this, that'll eventually turn the wheel, steam power. There's a few more things that Watt came up with an invention, or his invention that was more complex, but it's a pretty remarkable thing. Steam would power the Industrial Revolution. And the internal combustion engine today is basically this concept, with a few changes of um, Felix Dangmar, I can't remember his first name, but it'll come back to me in a second, uh, with, the, with the switching things. <laughs> but he can't bet to that office basic design. Electric motors have a very similar design. Pretty remarkable thing. Revolutionized world. And the thing is, once again, you can't have any yahoos or bad components. So you had to have better, more precise industry, which fueled more. Seven. Oh, no, I almost forgot. That's a steam powered car. Wouldn't that be awesome? The only problem is they blew up all the time. And so you really had to enjoy that ride because it literally could be your last. <laughs> innovation. Once you have more innovation, innovation builds another innovation. It's not that the people all of a sudden in the United States or Britain where a lot of this was happening were smarter than anybody else. They're building on other people's innovation because there was a need for it. Innovation, this is what you have to put down. Innovation will meet new demand. There is a demand for something and people innovate. So, for example, here are some. What's this? Elias Howell mentioned what? Yeah, you know, it's hand, the first, they're hand powered, but you could use that with a belt and eventually electric power. My grandma had one. One grandma had one that was hand powered, the other grandma had one that was a foot. You could turn it with your feet. Also, that had to be really hard. But that's how we had it back then. It was tough. We had a sewing machine powered by, by feet power and rocks. That's all we had. Clothing made of rocks. What did Morris invent? Well, he, no, he didn't. Well, he invented Morris code because he invented this the workable telegraph. And all it sent down the line was a little bit of electricity down a steel cable. And so you can get, if you had speakers and you can barely hear it, but you're listening really close, you can hear just like a little bit of a like, sound, like a little bit of static. So Morris code, long bit of static or short bit of static, is the way to communicate. And every 30 miles, they had to have a telegraph station at first because it would bleed out the steel cables. So you had some really interesting messages. But you had guys 24 hours a day just listen. That's your job. You listen. They come down the line. Eventually, with copper lines, it got better. In 60 years, they had a transatlantic cable. So you get telegraph lines from New York to London. So it's remarkable how fast that happened. And this is Eli Whitney's other big invention. What's that? It's called the cotton gin. We'll talk more about the cotton gin, but the cotton gin removed the seed from a peak from cotton. So you got the cotton puff. It made slavery 
or help make slavery profitable. Here's got more pieces of innovation. These ones would revolutionize and destroy small farmers. Cyrus McCormick invented this, pulled by a team of 12 horses. What is that? It's the mechanical reaper. It could do the work originally in 10, but eventually 20 people. Is this good for farmers? No. <laughs> it's expensive. Small farmers. This is about the end of small farmers. It sounded good. John Deere invented the steel tip plow, and that's his first one. This is a much more workable version of that. And that wheel above the plow would um, keep the dirt off, and so they have a nice clean cut. So you combine these two things, expensive, but you could grow a lot more. By the way, what do you do with your extra kids? Why do you have kids? Little farmers. Now you don't need them anymore. What do you do with them? Hope you enjoy the city and send them on their way. But here's the biggie. Why in the U.S.? For number eight, why in the U.S. did it develop this unique American system? Why here? Why did, why did people in the United States accept the machines more than they did in, let's say, France? To a lesser degree, England. Why did they accept them more? Why here? There are four big reasons why. And I chose this picture carefully because an iron ship built in Boston. That concept would have been seen as, as impossible to imagine 100 years earlier. And now you have iron ships that can haul goods, steam power, durable. Heck, put guns on them. Think about it. Take over. Take over. Number one, high demand. There's more demand in the United States. And partially because there's a larger middle, or what they call then a middling class. Now, the middle class is not the median. It's not the median. I mentioned this before, but we have the upper class. The upper class, for the most part, can enjoy a, a, li a lifestyle of luxury without, ba without necessarily having to work. And they have virtually everybody else. <clears throat> and they have to work, and virtually every penny goes to survival. The middle class, and it was maybe between 11 and 15% in the United States by 1850. That middle class, they had to work, but they can afford some of the trappings of an upper class life. That means they could buy more. The U.S. had a larger middle class than anybody else in the United States, or any else, anybody else in the United States, <laughs> anybody else in the world. It's still small, but they have. Today, the, uh, when I grew up, the United States had the largest middle class in the world. We don't anymore. Who does? No, China does. <laughs> China is huge lower class. Western Europe and Scandinavia. And, and Japan. Next, there was a chronic shortage of labor. Now, the chronic shortage of labor is two things. First off, there's a shortage of labor. What does that do to wages? By necessity. What, say it again there? Yeah, they go up. And so that increases demand. If more people have more money, they buy stuff. People have less money, they don't buy stuff. I mean, it's just simple logic. But there's one more thing. Since there's a shortage of skilled workers, there weren't as many people. This one we have to get. There weren't as many skilled workers to complain about machines taking their jobs. Machines weren't taking as many jobs in the U.S. way at first. And Britain, for example, the weavers who are losing their jobs to the machines, they, they try to break machines and try to stop it. United States, they weren't there. So they didn't resist as much. Now, after the Civil War, that shortage of labor is going to go away. Before the Civil War, that existed. Next. Okay, we already mentioned what capital was, but the one capital the U.S. had a lot of was fuel. A lot of water power, wood, coal, and then at the end of the century, oil. The U.S. had a lot of power that was cheap. Now, the wood, they cut down 90% of the trees by the end of the 19th century. 96% of the trees, I'm sorry, would be cut down. So there wasn't a lot of planning involved, just not a heck of a lot different than today. But the U.S. had a lot. And lastly, education. The United States had the highest literacy rate in the world. By far. By far. 
it was well over 90% in the North for men. About 70% in the South for men. Women were about 70% in the North were literate. Now, obviously, what means for literate, it might, or what's literate, in some ways, they're less literate than today. In some ways, they're more literate. You know, it just depends on the era. But the education does two things. First off, an educated workforce means an adaptable workforce. They can adapt to change much quicker. And this is something that is a misconception that people have to this day to talk about in school. In school, you're not necessarily going to learn things that you can use on the job. It doesn't quite work that way. What you do is you learn how to think and adapt. You learn how to listen and to absorb, to summarize, to you learn how to learn. That's what you're doing. And that's maybe the most important skill you ever have. You know, and it starts back here, but the rate of technological change then was revolutionary. It still happens today. The technology of today will be obsolete. The technology when I was a kid is obsolete in a lot of ways. So you're not, I mean that, why you learn that is, is kind of silly. What you learn how to do is learn how to think. Big advantage. Boy, what an amazing thing we have in the United States now. We spend all this money for you to learn. Never again in your life will there be anything like this again. Where people will say, wow, we're going to do whatever we can to help you. It's a system it is today. When you get out, it's like, and now, good luck. You guys are really lucky. It's pretty remarkable. We take it for granted, which is sad, but it's really incredible. But what's the other thing education does? It indoctrinates you. You learn how to be a factory worker. You learn how to obey. You learn to love the system. That's what you learn from day one. Everything you do in school, you're being manipulated to think and feel a certain way. Right? It's fourth period. You're all what? Hungry. You think that's accidental? No. You eat when we tell you to eat. Look at that. Okay, we have somebody. Have you noticed there's a lot of little crutches this year? What's the deal with that? The bell rings, and what do we all do? <laughs> right? Oh, the bell ring. We listen. Uh, there will be no open campsite. There's no open campsite. When you go to the bathroom, right? Hey, be quiet and obey, right? You learn that from day one. You think that's accidental? What called people to go into work for a factory? What was it? It's a whistle that calls you into school. You think that's a coincidence? No. From day one, you're taught to obey. What have all of you done every period? What have you done? You've looked at that thing, right? Right? You think that's accidental? Before the Industrial Revolution, no one gave a time. No one gave a damn what time it was. You worked when you wanted to work, you went home. You, who cares? Well, you're in a factory, they want you there at a the time. You're punished if you're tardy, aren't you? Why? To be good factory workers, to obey, <laughs> to follow orders. And think about it for a second. It used to not be that way. But for your whole life, it's been that way. For my whole life, it's been that way. So what do you think? How long has it been like this? Always. So if you don't like what's going on, what are you? Shut up. It's always been this way. Accept it. You're hungry? No. You still got two minutes to wait. And I might keep you afterwards, but you must obey me. You're being indoctrinated. What's the problem with being indoctrinated? Yeah. Exactly. Remember what I told you. Men did not want this system. But they sent their kids to school where they learned it. And now? Right? And it, it's a good thing, isn't it? But is it? And you're being indoctrinated every moment. Actually, the world problem, and let's be clear. It, it might be the best way to do this. We can argue about this, but here's the thing. What's bad about a knock and knock is not only you lose your free will, but you're not told you're being taught. You just accept it. You're not being told this. 
And by the way, what I'm telling you, no, you're not going to do that. It's true. That doesn't mean you can leave now. You've got to wait for the bell. <laughs> yeah, that's how, and you look at the clock, right? I must obey the clock. <laughs> it's amazing. We all forgot that. We used to not be like this. Now we obey. See, look, you all get up. Look out in the hallway. It's going to be full, right? There's nobody in the hallway. And you notice we have shortened periods and weird periods, short periods of trying to hungry? Yeah. You're being trained. Have lost dog, people. Turn it off. Oh, you are here. You're a good person. The bell rang, you can. Someone already wrote on this, but you can figure this out. For number five, so who wrote Moby Dick? Melvin. Melvin. You got one right. 